Hello, my name's Annie Drew and I'm an intern here in Venice at the Peggy Guggenheim Collection. This is my second Peggy talk and I would like to talk about Peggy's family and perhaps find some things that you didn't previously know. Uh, both of Peggy's great-grandfathers came from Europe and emigrated to America. Her great-grandfather on the Guggenheim side was Simon Guggenheim and he started business buying and selling, importing and exporting uh, stove polish and coffee essence. His son, Mayer, went into business with him and then expanded the family business into the mining industry and made the family fortune. Mayer had 10 children and seven of those were sons and one of the youngest of his sons was Benjamin, uh, very much the darling of the family. And Benjamin was Peggy's father. Peggy's mother was Florette Seligman, and the Seligmans were also very wealthy, not perhaps quite as wealthy, well, they weren't, they weren't as wealthy as the Guggenheims, but they felt socially superior to, to the Guggenheims, and they used to tease Florette that perhaps she'd somewhat married beneath herself to marry Benjamin. Um, Peggy describes her, her family in her memoirs, and she says of her mother's side that they were peculiar, if not mad. Uh, and she describes some of her aunts and uncles. She describes her aunt Fanny as always wearing a feather boa and a long trailing dress that she would have hat pins hanging precariously from her hair rather than her hat. And she would always wear a, 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 a rose behind her ear. She said that uh, she would clean everything um, almost neurotically because she was terrified of, of germs. Um, but the thing that she was really well known for was the fact that she didn't like to talk normally with words that she likes to sing everything as, as if she was a soprano and after more than 30 years of marriage this seemed to have been too much for her husband who one day tried to kill her with a golf club and having failed he then drowned himself in the New York reservoir by tying weights to his feet. Another uncle ate coal and always had very black teeth as a result and he also had a coat and in his coat he would have a special zinc pocket and in his zinc pocket he kept his ice and when he wasn't chewing on coal he would chew on ice instead. He would drink whiskey before breakfast and he was addicted to gambling so he often ended up with no money and to solve that particular problem he would blackmail his father by saying that if he didn't give him more money that he would kill himself. And on one occasion, whether it was a cry for help or uh, it, it, it just went too far, um, he did, in fact, kill himself. Um, so she lost that uncle. And she had another uncle who she described as miserly. And although he wouldn't spend any money, he would turn up at a dinner party halfway through and eat everything that was there. And then he would pretend to be a snake and wriggle on his stomach under all the, under all the chairs. I think much to the delight of the children. Um, but it was a, a, I think it was quite an eccentric, a very wealthy, but a very eccentric upbringing. OK, so back to Peggy's parents. Her father, Benjamin, was one of the youngest of his siblings and a darling of the Guggenheim family who did not receive a formal business education and was not part of the main family business. He preferred to find commercial ideas of his own, which also gave him freedom to travel and pursue his own interests, which included being a playboy. When he drowned on the Titanic in 1912, he was widely reported to have heroically given up his place in the lifeboat for women and children, and it was assumed that the woman he had been travelling with that survived was his wife, when in fact she was his mistress. The scandal that ensued must have been really hard on Peggy, who was only 14, as well as on her mother and sisters. The emotional loss of her father was, was enormous, but it also had huge financial repercussions, and it left Peggy feeling very much like the poor relation in comparison to her cousins, and not really a proper Guggenheim anymore. This is a photo of her mother, Sel Florette Seligman, with, with Benjamin. Peggy said that she had a really annoying way of saying everything and saying and doing everything three times and that her mother drove her mad and she had no control at all over Peggy. When asked if she thought if Florette had been a good mother, Peggy very fairly replied that no one really was in those days. Perhaps Peggy's lack of a relationship with either of her parents explains her own later difficulties being a wife and a mother herself. Peggy describes her childhood as being awful and one long protracted agony. As she grew up, she became more of a rebel 
At school, she shaved off her eyebrows and increasingly felt like an outsider within her own highly privileged social circles. She had no intention of following her expected path of marrying somebody of a similar background and quietly settling down to have a football team of children. As soon as she was financially independent at 21, she went off and got herself a job in an avant-garde bookstore called The Sun Wise Turn with other bohemian people and she quickly felt that she had something in common with them. Interestingly, even here it turned out she was not safe from her family as one day one of her aunts turned up. Having redecorated her enormous house, she decided that she needed to fill her library so she came to inquire of Peggy whether it was possible to buy books there by the yard. Peggy had two sisters, Benita and Hazel. She was very close to her sister Benita, who was only three years older than herself, because they shared a lonely childhood with cruel, cold nannies and governesses. Benita, it seemed, was happier to fit into her expected role. She got married and was desperate to have children, but had endless problems conceiving. Finally, she did fall pregnant, but sadly then died in childbirth in 1927. Peggy found losing her sister Benita really hard. Her sister Hazel was five years younger, and perhaps this is the reason that she seems to have been quite separate to her sisters growing up. However, her childhood seems to have been no easier than her sisters, and it was said that her mother, Florette, always blamed Hazel for the death of her husband, saying that he only took that passage on the Titanic because he was rushing to come home for her ninth birthday. One can only imagine how large a burden that must have been for a child to carry. Unfortunately, too, Hazel is best known for the terrible tragedy that occurred in 1928 when her first two children, who were only four and one, somehow fell from a 16-storey New York City hotel rooftop. She had been in the process of divorcing her second husband and had reportedly told friends that she would rather see her children dead than let him have them. Although this tragedy was officially ruled as an accident, the incident sent shockwaves throughout the upper-crust world Jewish of Jewish aristocracy and it left Hazel per- permanently stigmatised. She lived out the rest of her life feeling like an exiled black sheep of the family. As Peggy felt exactly the same way as a persona non grata in relation to her family, one might think that this would have resulted in her seeking out her sister, especially as they also shared a passion for art, and it was central to both of their lives. Hazel had begun painting as a teenager, and like Peggy, had then been very involved in the bohemian life of the 1920s Paris scene with her second husband. With her third husband, yes, she had six in all, so perhaps another similarity to Peggy is having an appetite for relationships. So with her third husband, she moved to England and began to paint in earnest, using her new married name of King Farlow. Her first exhibitions of paintings were held in England in the 1930s under this name and her many watercolours, drawings and oil paintings were shown in galleries all around the world. Throughout the remainder of her life, just like Peggy, her many acquaintances included members of the European and American avant-garde and modernist movements. She was known for her salons and parties that brought some of the most interesting personalities of the 20th century art and literary worlds together. It seems so strange to me that two sisters, who both managed to carve out lives on their own terms and travelled in similar worlds and social circles, never sought each other out, and yet Hazel remains almost completely unmentioned by Peggy in either her memoirs or in her interviews. Peggy left her life in New York to go to Paris in 1921 and soon met Lawrence Vail, a Dada writer and artist known as the King of Bohemia. Through him, she met many of the avant-garde artists of the day, perhaps most importantly Marcel Duchamp, who remained a lifelong friend and an important teacher and advisor in helping her to develop her taste in art. She married Lawrence the following year and they had two children, Simbad and Peguine. However, their marriage was not easy, they fought a lot and they divorced after seven years, leaving the true children with a very unsettled childhood. In 1929, she was very much in love with John Holmes an English writer and war hero who seemed to suffer from writer's block and drank heavily. But Peggy clearly adored him and she always said that he was the one true love of her life. In an interview much later in life, she confessed to having had at least seven abortions with him because she said at that time it was just not possible to have his children out of wedlock. Holmes was still married because divorcing his previous wife was yet another thing he never seemed able to get around to. I think this must have all been much harder emotionally for Peggy than she made it sound.' 
Holmes himself sadly died after a routine surgery for a wrist that he broke in a riding accident, having drunk too much the night before the anaesthetic. So Peggy, having lost her father, her sister, divorced Lawrence Vale and then lost the love of her life, had to have a big rethink as to what she was going to do. Having taken advice from friends, particularly Marcel Duchamp, in 1938 she opened a modern art gallery in London that she called Guggenheim Jeune. One of the many exhibitions that she decided to hold and created herself was an exhibition of paintings and drawings by children. She included some of her daughter Peggy's work, as well as the work of a young Lucian Freud, the grandson of psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, who even as a child was already mad keen on making art. This means that Peggy was, in fact, the first person to ever exhibit Lucian Freud's work. In December 1939, after opening Guggenheim Jeune, Peggy had a brief but very intensive affair with Samuel Beckett. Apparently neither of them left the hotel room for days on end except to order more champagne. Beckett was another person who really encouraged her to turn exclusively to modern art. So Peggy decides to close uh, Guggenheim Jeune a year and a half later as it was losing money and she's now decided that her dream is to continue to promote abstract art in a different way by opening a museum of contemporary art. She is no doubt inspired by her uncle Solomon who had recently created the Guggenheim Foundation and then subsequently opened his own museum of non-objective art that same year of 1939. To provide content for her new venture, Peggy asks the art historian and art critic Herbert Reed to draw her up a list of paintings that she should try to obtain, which is then revised by Marcel Duchamp. So Peggy went to Paris with her shopping list, $40,000 to spend, and the determination to try to collect one painting a day. As the war progressed, she realised that her idea of a museum in London was untenable, so she decided to collect the artworks for herself. She visited a large number of artists and many more came to her as they wanted to escape the Nazis and she managed to put together a remarkable collection. The only person who in fact turns Peggy away is Picasso, who having seen her enter his studio, with a wave of his hand advises her that the lingerie department was on the second floor. She realised that her collection needed to be stored somewhere safe while she worked out how to get it back to America. Having been snubbed by the Louvre, who told her that her paintings were simply not worth saving, she took them to the south of France and a friend helped her arrange their shipment back to New York. They were placed in containers and marked household goods, packed with pots and pans, and her Jewish-sounding name was removed from all the paperwork. Her next problem was how to get herself back to America. She moved to Lisbon, and by now she had a chaotic extended family, which included her ex-husband and their two teenage children, her ex-husband, soon-to-be ex-wife and their children, and the painter Max Ernst, who she counted as family because he was already, in Peggy's mind, her husband very soon-to-be. They managed to catch a Pan Am clipper flight back to New York in July 1941, and she recalls having had a very uncomfortable flight. But what her memoirs do not say is that on the very next flight, the same plane fatally crashes and left no survivors. Once back in New York, she married Max Ernst in 1941, even though she knew he was already in love with Leonora Carrington. In 1942, Peggy resumed her previous idea of having a museum art gallery and opened Art of the Century in central Manhattan in New York. The following year, in 1943, she decided to put a show on there called Exhibition by 31 Women, in which her daughter Peggy was one of the women who showed her work. Max Ernst helped Peggy with this exhibition and became enchanted with another female contributor called Dorothea Tanning and for whom Ernst then left Peggy. In an interview about this exhibition sometime later, with her quirky humour, Peggy jokingly conceded that perhaps it might have been rather better if she'd only had 30 women in her, in her exhibition. Once the war is over, Peggy decides to leave New York and return to Venice, having upset most of her family with the publication of her first edition of her memoirs. She was so frank about herself, her friends, and especially her family, that her uncles tried to buy up the entire print run. In 1948, she's invited to show her collection in the Greek pavilion of the Venice Biennale, and the following year she purchased the Palazzo Venia di Leoni. Peggy is with her at this stage and has a studio in the Palazzo. Peggy clearly loved her daughter very much, but it was, she was also very controlling, and they definitely had a very difficult relationship. Peggy was very fragile and suffered from depression, 
She desperately wanted her mother's love, but also found her overwhelming and constantly found herself in the middle of an emotional tug of war between her mother and her husband's, particularly her second husband, Ralph Rumney, who Peggy detested. Each blamed the other for Peggy's deteriorating condition, and in 1967, Peggy tragically died having taken an overdose of medication, leaving four children behind. Peggy could never accept that it had been a suicide. Within the present Peggy Guggenheim, there is a room dedicated to Peggy. It is clear from her numerous exhibitions across Europe and the United States that her art was widely admired. Her style best described as a combination of naive and surrealist art. Although her works seem cheerful and carefree, one can sense in them a second lining of melancholy and sadness. It's a hard, it's, it is hard not to feel that perhaps she was trying to make up for her own lack of a happy family in her paintings, where everyone seems so joyful and loved. The more time I've spent with these paintings, the more I've grown to like them. But of particular interest to me were the two types of strange glass sculptures that are also on display in this room. One is a collection of small golden coloured figures that are displayed in a box. And then on the window, there's a collection of individual blue glass figures. And I wanted to know more about them. They were, both, they, they were all made by Egidio Costantini, who was originally a glass agent, which allowed him to get to know and to work with the master glass blowers and to learn about the in- intricacies of the trade. He wanted to elevate the craft of glass blowing to the same level as sculpture and painting. So in 1950, he created a project that mediated collaborations between the glass blowers and initially the Venetian artists to create glass sculptures by translating their drawings. Four years later, he went to Paris to promote his project to the most famous artists of the time, and this led to collaborations with Alexander Calder, Gino Severini, Pablo Picasso, Jean Arp, Max Ernst, and many others. In 1955, he opened his own gallery in Venice, but despite being successful initially, the gallery was forced to shut in 1958. However, it reopened in 1961 thanks to financial help from Peggy, who then exhibited his work at her palazzo. Peggy got to know Costantini at this time, and he made these golden figures as a translation of Peggy's work. The blue sculptures in the window are also by Costantini, and they are called 23 glass sculptures after sketches by Picasso, and they were made in 1964. No story about Peggy would be complete without reference to her uncle Solomon. Their relationship was difficult, despite similar interests in abstract art. Peggy saw herself as an outsider to the Guggenheim relatives and financially inferior, but there is little doubt that the main tension was probably due to Solomon's curator and director, who was almost certainly his mistress, the eccentric and autocratic Baroness Hill Rebe. Not many people found her easy, and she was generally known as the Baroness. The rest of the Guggenheim family were less kind and always referred to her as the Bee, and this bee did not stand for Baroness. She very much looked down on whatever Peggy did and made her disdain clear, and she became a wedge between Peggy and her uncle. Even when Peggy was trying to salvage art from war-torn Europe, she sometimes found herself competing with Ribe, who even managed to buy works from the Nazis' degenerate art exhibition. Almost unbelievably, after this exhibition had finished, the Nazis, despite their declared feeling about the works, decided to recoup whatever they could financially, and many artworks were sold through Swiss auction houses. Only those that could not be sold were burnt. It was after Solomon's death in 1949, and the Baroness stepping down in 1952, that it became possible for bridges to be built. Harry, one of Solomon's sons, welcomed Peggy when she went back to New York in 1959 and showed her around the the then as yet unopened new landmark building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Peggy was certainly not won over by its design and felt it was a little cramped in its situation and would really have been so much better placed within Central Park. She loved to refer to this building as her uncle's garage. After this meeting, the idea of Peggy leaving her palazzo to her and her collection to the foundation was floated, but Harry made it clear that they were not interested, and once again Peggy felt snubbed. She spent much of the next ten years in turmoil as to who she should leave her collection to, her own foundation, her children, the Venetian authorities, or even the Tate in London. Moving the collection seemed to have enormous tax implications, 
and it wasn't until the mid-60s, when she was still deliberating, that there was a change in attitude from New York, who said that actually they might be interested, and they invited Peggy to have an exhibition there, using two-thirds of her artworks in 1969. This exhibition was a huge success with fantastic reviews and it seemed to heal many of the wounds for Peggy. She told one reporter that she never dreamt that she would see her collection in her uncle's museum and that one day she would see it descending the ramp like the nude descended the staircase. As a result, Peggy decided to leave her home and her collection to the Solomon Guggenheim Foundation. A decade later, in 1979, when she died at the age of 81, she said of her bequest, It was rather a joke since I wasn't on very good terms with my uncle. But it was given on the basis that the collection would never be divided, sold, or ever leave Venice. To conclude, it feels perhaps like a drawing together of all these family threads and both family museums, when three years ago, in 2017, Carol Vale, the daughter of Peggy's son Simbad, left the curatorial staff at the Solomon Guggenheim Museum to become the director of Peggy's unique personal collection here in Venice. She has managed to keep her collection safe within the global Guggenheim collection, and yet it is now run day to day by one of her grandchildren. I think Peggy would have been very happy about this. Thank you very much for listening.